Welcome back. This is a lecture on Chapter 12, which is about research and business proposals and planning for business reports. Obviously a very important topic. A lot of great information here, and it's information that I think you'll be able to use in school as well as uh, in your career. And really, no matter what kind of career you go into, if it involves professional communication in any capacity, uh, the information in this lecture will be uh, vital to that. Uh, to set the stage, you have a uh, made a posted a, a link rather to a, a little skit from a show called yes prime minister it's a british comedy series that uh, i don't know why it doesn't get more attention here it's really really funny uh, but anyway the little clip is about uh ways that surveys can be skewed uh, with leading uh questions to arrive at the polar opposite responses at the uh, at the end of it it's really a, a fun sketch very enlightening so take a look at that uh, sketch and then when you come back reflect on it a little bit and see if you can explain how it is that the uh, uh, the responder at the end of the surveys <laughs> comes away with totally opposite uh, con uh, opposite uh, answers to that final question uh, so ponder on that and then come back and then we'll finish the uh, lecture all right and here are the learning objectives for this chapter uh, we'll be talking about how planning and conducting business research for reports impacts your credibility. And this is probably the key learning objective here. Uh, if, you, if you don't trust a report, if you don't feel like the person has done proper research or the research has been conducted unethically, uh, then everything else is kind of a moot point, right? Uh, so that's really vital that you are able to create trustworthy, credible reports. Uh, we'll talk about uh, research objectives. You know, wh what are they, and how can you make, uh, narrow those down, make them specific, and also make them achievable, something practical that you can actually get done. Uh, we'll talk about principles of effective design for survey questions and choices, how to avoid that uh, leading question, and amongst other topics. Talking, uh, also talk about charts and tables to concisely display the data, but also accentuate the key messages. Uh, we'll be talking about the usefulness of data sources for business research. Where do you get the data? Uh, we'll talk about secondary research. So a lot of people think once they get out of college, uh, they won't have to go to a library. <laughs> they won't have to do any database uh, research. That will all be behind them. Uh, when in reality, uh, that might just be where it begins. <laughs> so, uh, so hopefully you, you can uh, learn how to enjoy this process. And uh, it's not really that hard. And you can obviously, uh, it's very, very useful. Uh, we'll talk about research evaluating, rather, research data, charts, and tables in terms of fairness as well as effectiveness. So not just is it a clear chart, but is it a fair chart? Is it honest? <laughs> is it ethical? Because uh, there are lots and lots of ways to be dishonest when it comes to charts and tables. Okay. Here's the chapter overview, and as you can see, it pretty much matches the learning objectives as usual. All right, so the first step is to analyze the audience for the report. So you might be writing a, a task with uh, producing a white paper or something less formal than that. You know, there's all manner of reports. There's all kinds of decisions a company comes up with. Uh, I can think of countless ones here at St. Cloud State that I've uh, been tasked with. Uh, so maybe the uh, department or the college is thinking about a new software package, right? And it might cost a lot of money. And so they want to they don't want to just guess or just pick something at random or just only listen to the salespeople. Uh, they might want some research done. And I've been at universities where the uh, they'll get the uh, instead of just one person picking the textbook, for example, uh, for all the English 191 classes, uh, sometimes the directors will task uh, they'll put together a small group of uh, graduate students to do some research, figure out what the other textbooks are, how much they cost, <laughs> etc. So there's just a few examples from school. Of course, you could think of uh, all kinds of business scenarios. Uh, do you need a new parking lot? Uh, maybe the government has passed a new policy, a new law of some sort, and they're trying to figure out what the, what's, what's the impact going to be of this, or how can we minimize uh, the impact of this? Let's say it's a new uh, environmental policy. Uh, so all manner of things that will arise in a business where they need some research done. And you know, as the book uh, points out, if there's a little video that goes with it too, if you watch the uh, if you go to the website and click on the link to the author <laughs> author videos, he tells you more about this. But uh, the reality is, if you're good at this, if you can write well, but also research well and help out the decision makers, then you will quickly become that go-to person. 
Next thing you know, you're promoted. Next thing you know, you're the manager yourself. Uh, so these are vital skills and everybody wants to, uh, you know, all businesses put this high up on their list of priorities for what they want their employees to be able to do, not just read reports, uh, but be able to write reports. Uh, okay, so uh, again, we're spending time with the audience. Uh, the This isn't a school assignment. <laughs> Your uh, boss tells you to prepare a uh, report on uh, you know which type of computer should we buy or what type of mobile plan whatever uh, so they're not going to be giving you things like a word count uh, or how many sources that you need uh, things that if you even <laughs> if you ask something that silly uh, they'll just tell you well it just needs to be as long as it needs uh, the key the thing is have you answered the question or not uh, have you produced enough information for me to be able to make a, a valid decision here uh, that's what should be guiding uh, the process. So that's why it's so important to sit down with these decision makers. You know, what are the goals? What are you looking for? The cheapest plan, uh, the plan with the most uh, range, uh, you know, the most reliable company. I mean, there's all sorts of uh, different things they might be looking for. You don't know until you sit down and talk to them, ask them about it. Uh, same thing with the objectives of the research. What do we want to, what's the takeaway of this research? What do we get out of this? Uh, and then expectations too. Uh, is this a one, is this an informal thing? This is going to be one meeting and done. <laughs> uh, it's the expectation that this will be, uh, you know, a year-long project with a, a thick publication at the end, multiple presentations, a global outreach. Again, none of this might be apparent. That's why you have to uh, ask about it. All right, so you probably know this one already, uh, but <laughs> every time I say that, <laughs> I think it scares people. <laughs> oh, I should know that already. Maybe you don't. Uh, this could be the first time you've encountered these terms. Uh, so I won't take anything uh, for granted here. Uh, but there are basically two kinds of research. There's primary research, and that just means that you're out there collecting data yourself, your company's doing it. Uh, you might be giving the, <laughs> maybe you have a staff you're working with, uh, but maybe this could be, uh, say, surveys, right? Uh, or it could be, coming back to our textbook example, you know, let's say that, I set you up with this assignment. I want you to write a report for me that uh, I want you to figure out what textbooks are available for English 191, uh, which ones have eBooks, uh, how much does each one cost, are there discounts? You know, I might give you a variety of uh, questions to answer like that, right? So if it's primary research, uh, that means that you're doing that yourself, right? So you might be calling up these companies, uh, asking questions or emailing them. Uh, you're not just relying on what somebody else has collected, which would be this, this other option, the secondary research. Uh, so for this one, I might say, you know, go to this web page. Somebody's already done this work. They've uh, listed out all the textbooks available, how much they cost, all the information. <laughs> uh, so it's too much for me to look at right now. Why don't you go take a look at that research, digest it for me, and write a summary with some recommendations. So you see the difference there, right? Uh, the primary, you're doing this data collection yourself. Secondary research, it's already there. Maybe there's a website, government publications, uh, you name it. And most, I think most of the times you'll be using, you just about always use some form of secondary research, right? Uh, but <laughs> you might very well be doing the bulk of this yourself, uh, especially if it's something new. Uh, sometimes I get students that want to do thesis projects about uh, something like some new social network or tool or something. It's, it's only been out maybe for a year. Uh, so there's not a lot of uh, peer review journal articles. Maybe there's none. It just hasn't had enough time. Uh, so for those kind of projects, they, will, they definitely will be doing primary research because they'll have to supply the, the data. This doesn't exist. Uh, but at the same time, they might be looking at secondary sources about similar technologies or just uh, technology in general or even uh, like books about how to do the research, right? Okay, so hopefully that's clear. Uh, gathering information through primary research. And they say that quite rightly that the survey is the tool of choice, especially the online <laughs> survey. <laughs> and I don't know how you can possibly have made it to this point in your life without encountering, <laughs> or at least completing, <laughs> one of these surveys. I mean, they are everywhere. And they range from just fun things like, uh, you know, what kind of dog are you? <laughs> what breed of dog are you? <laughs> uh, or what character would you are you most like? You know, so fun little surveys like that all the way down to uh, maybe you're thinking about a college you'd like to attend. And there might be some surveys there to help you answer that question. Of course, businesses do these all the time.
And if you, you know, if you look next time you go out to, to eat or something, look, or really any store, <laughs> look at that receipt. Now, my, my guess is at the bottom of the receipt somewhere, there will be a link and something about an online survey, and they'll say, you know, if, yeah, we'll give you a coupon or the chance to win something, uh, some kind of reward if you'll just complete this little online survey. Uh, so these things, basically what I'm saying is these things are ubiquitous. Uh, and survey research generally involves uh, administering these uh, written questionnaires. Right, I don't know <laughs> what kind of a survey they would be. <laughs> uh, so this basically you'll be writing the questions for them to answer. And it's, it sounds easy, right? Oh, I can do that. Sure, no problem. Uh, but we'll see those. There's lots of ways to go wrong when you're writing these surveys. It's hard to, it's actually a, quite a skill to be able to write a good survey that doesn't bias uh, the respondent, that's totally fair and neutral. And that's really what you want because otherwise, again, you can't trust the survey results. If, it, if it's just a bunch of leading questions, uh, well, that calls into question the whole survey. It's basically useless uh, for any kind of a legitimate purposes. Okay, so on to these uh, question types. And again, we have basically just two types, uh, the closed question and the open-ended question. Uh, the closed question could be a multiple choice thing, uh, just a yes or no question, true or false, you know, something along those lines. Whereas the open-ended question is something that they can't just say yes or no, or A, B, C, D. <laughs> uh, so most surveys will have both of these types. Uh, they might have, a, if it's a restaurant, for example, I, I, I'm always talking about restaurants because every time I'm going there, there's usually, it takes a while to get the meal. <laughs> you know, they're, they're cooking it, I suppose. And so I like to look around, see if there's a survey uh, that I can study uh, to see what, you know, what they put for uh, the questions. But usually it would be something like, uh, you know, how would you rate the service? Uh, good, uh, poor, needs work, you know, they, they have different wording. It might be service, might be uh, a variety of the menu, you know, and on, just cleanliness, uh, things of that sort. So these would just be quick answers, you know, you fill in the bubble, check the box, boom. Uh, but then at the bottom somewhere, they might have a just a blank space and they say, please, uh, you know, let us know or make a comment, general comment about what you th thought about your experience. Is there anything that we can improve upon? I said, that'd be an open-ended question. I have to write in uh, the answer. Uh, the problem is uh, these closed questions are great because th you can easily enter those into the computer, into a database, and make all kinds of charts and graphs based on it. Uh, with this kind of question, though, uh, somebody has to read that, figure out sort of the gist of it, how to categorize it. Uh, sometimes you can't. <laughs> you never know what somebody might put in. They might just put in <laughs> a supercalifragilisticexpialidocious or something. Uh, what do you do with that? Uh, so that's the problem with the open-ended question. But on the other hand, this is very useful because sometimes you can figure out things this way uh, that you can't from the closed question. Uh, the research objectives. So remember, this is one of the things you sit down and talk about with your uh, boss or who's ever you know, assigning you this project. I say, say what, what objective? What is the objective of this research? What do I want to find out, basically? And by the way, this is all true of thesis and starred papers or portfolios. You will be asked, uh, what is your research objective? Or sometimes they call this a research question. Uh, what are you trying to find out? And it's very important to get this, to get this right. Uh, you, you probably go through several drafts of the research objective until you, or question until you find something that's manageable and specific enough uh, that you can actually do the research and th that you're asking something that's <laughs> worthwhile to find out. It's not just, oh, wh why is the sky blue? Not a good research objective, right? You could just look that up, <laughs> look that up in 10 seconds. You know, we want to find something that's going to require uh, legitimate research. But anyway, let's look at some of the examples here. Uh, less effective, determine how satisfied our conference guests are. So, you know, at first that sounds like a good research objective, right? Uh, why, why do you want to do this research? Well, we just want to find out how satisfied our conference guests are. So it sounds okay until you really start thinking about, well, what would that, you know, how would you actually do that research? You know, what kind of surveys are you thinking about there? And, and what do you mean satisfaction? Satisfied with what? <laughs> you know, there's unlimited things, right? And so it's very broad. I mean, you might get something useful out of this, but it's certainly not a very focused thing to be looking at. And by the way, this is the 
most common problem with the culminating projects basically every single time <laughs> every uh, student I've advised uh, they come in with a very broad research objective and then we spend the rest of the at least the first couple of meetings just just narrowing this down uh, into something that you can reasonably ex expect to get done uh, in one semester uh, so let's look at the more effective version so they still have determined guest satisfaction uh, but now they've made a little more a little bit more specific by adding this other part so determine guest satisfaction among conference attendees for key conference amenities and services. So this is the key bit right here. So they'll just be looking at, you know, are you satisfied with the amenities? <laughs> I guess, you know, the, the swimming pool, whatever, <laughs> uh, as well as the services. You know, I don't know what all the services were being offered. Room service, maybe. Coffee, breakfast, who knows? Uh, so anyway, you've narrowed it down. Uh, you can find the answer to this out. And this uh, also the person that, you know, the boss might say, well, we don't care about the services. So, so take that out and <laughs> just look at the conference amenities. Uh, so writing it out like this gives them a better picture, too, of uh, whether they want to fund this or not. Now, let's look at another example here. So less effective. Understand green meetings. Uh, so again, very broad, not very specific. Uh, there's not any context to it either. You know, what, what is a green meeting? <laughs> what is that? Um, so yeah, it'd be good to understand it. Uh, but again, that's probably not the best way to put, phrase your research objective. And so let's look at the more effective example. Uh, identify key trends impacting the market demand for green meetings held at hotels. Uh, so you don't need a you don't have to be an expert to see how this would be more appealing to somebody that's working in a little thing called business where they're trying to make money, trying to get money, trying to get good value for the money. Uh, here we can see that this is not just some kind of philosophical uh, research objective. Uh, this is very practical. You know, what are the key trends? Well, basically, what are other people doing uh, that impact the market demand? In other words, uh, how many people uh, care about these green meetings? And it's uh, sticking to the hotels. Uh, so we're not just looking at green meetings in general, but just the ones at hotels. So a lot more specific. It's very relevant. I guess that's the word I was looking for. It's relevant to the business, which is a hotel chain called the Prestigio. All right, I imagine this is all making a sense so far. All right, creating surveys. Now we get down to the nuts and bolts of this. Uh, so obviously, this is being done all over the place. Why is it being done? Kind of for answers, kind of already answered that <laughs> because it's easy to, to get these out, especially online. <clears throat> I mean, it basically costs nothing. Survey monkey, uh, five or six questions, boom. Uh, spam that out to your Facebook friends or whatever email list you have. Uh, hopefully people will, will uh, respond. And this chapter really doesn't get in, it gets a little bit into it, but there's a lot of uh, ethics involved with surveys and again lots of ways you could be misleading uh, but you know some of the things to think about is uh, what kind of people are incentivized to respond to the survey and are those people truly representative of the uh, intended clientele or, or whatever population you're <laughs> trying to make generalizations about <laughs> and so for example if I said uh, if I was around St. Cloud State and I said I'm you know, here's a survey, and if you do the survey, I will reward you <laughs> with some strips of bacon. Okay, so think about that. Bacon as a reward for doing the survey, great. A lot of people love bacon, uh, but also there's people that can't eat bacon, either for dietary or religious reasons, or they just don't like bacon. <laughs> uh, so you're going to rule out some people. Uh, anyway, kind of a silly example, but I think it gets uh, the point across. You know, you, you, you want to get a good sample of people, different kinds of people that represent that, that group. Uh, in business, the good news is usually this is easier than just some kind of campus survey. Uh, because here, you've, if they're customers of your business, you probably have their contact info. So you know their phone number <laughs> or their email list or whatever. You know what stuff they bought. So you have some information about them. So you're not just out there bl uh, blindly. Uh, spewing these surveys out to just anybody. Uh, so that really helps. Uh, but it could be you're maybe looking for potential customers, right? People that you don't have that information for. Uh, this is one of those 
advertisers pay the big bucks. There's, there's so much interest right now in social media, you know, like Facebook, uh, because when you advertise on Facebook, you can specify a specific demographic of people. Maybe only you just want to advertise to people who like to page about uh, Cocker Spaniels. <laughs> uh, and by the way, uh, people from Minnesota, people within a certain range, because you're selling uh, some kind of Cocker Spaniel <laughs> merchandise uh, of some sort. So you can see it's a very like a laser focused uh, advertising. And basically, it's in kind of a sneaky way, Facebook got that information via surveys. Uh, you probably thought you were just registering on the site, filling out your likes and joining, a, you know, liking pages and group, joining groups. Uh, but kind of in a weird way, you're also, while you're doing that, basically filling out surveys uh, that Facebook can then turn around and sell to the uh, advertisers, right? All right. <laughs> kind of a tangent. All right. Survey questions should be the following. Simple to answer. You know, we might want to impress the professor with some long words and long-winded sentences, but that's going to be totally ineffective in, in reality. <laughs> Non-leading, for reasons that were clear from the Yes Prime Minister sketch. Exhaustive. Oh, that sounds tiresome, doesn't it? And unambiguous. And then limited to a single idea, which I think ties in. It's basically the same as simple to answer. If your question is not simple to answer, it's probably because you've got multiple ideas running around. Uh, you don't want that. These things ought to be quick and dirty. Boom, boom, boom. Move on to the next one. Boom, boom. Uh, if you tell somebody, hey, uh, would you mind filling out my survey? It takes about two hours. <laughs> Hell no. Uh, maybe if it's two minutes, though. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Two minutes. You know, give me the survey. Boom. Or they don't want to have to think about it. All right. We talked about non-leading questions, and these are ones that don't suggest uh, the answer. Uh, we saw that in the clip, right? You sort of set the person up uh, to answer it a certain way. It's very dishonest. And by the way, this one here, uh, that, that sketch was humorous. It's satire. Uh, but I've gotten plenty of so-called phone surveys right around when there's an election and you start to get all these uh, fake surveys. And the, basically, it sounds like they're just, they'll say something like, well, we're just polling people in the St. Cloud area to figure out how they feel about such and such a policies, right? Uh, they might ask you a bunch of questions about the, uh, let's say your thoughts about environmental safety, environmental uh, protections, you know, that sort of thing. So you just feel like you're just filling out this uh, uh, objective survey, but then you slowly but surely they start leading you toward the particular candidate you know there'd be a <laughs> maybe you say yes to all these yes i care about the environment yes i care about recycling and blah 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 and then the final question would be something like well well did you know that john smith who's running for <laughs> congress <laughs> or whatever is a big supporter of the environment uh, oh i didn't know that well maybe you should vote for it. so they're very obviously that's not a legitimate survey that's just uh, manipulation that's, that's what we don't want to do, unless, of course, you want to be manipulative and, and, and evil and <laughs> waste people's time. And <laughs> it, it backfires on me because I think, man, I would not ever vote for somebody uh, that's pulling that kind of, a, uh, that's engaged in that kind of shenanigans. Uh, anyway, that's the leading questions. Uh, the exhaustive question means that simply that you've exhausted all the possibilities. It's not that you've tired them out. <laughs> you've, you've worn them out. <laughs> Got a good survey workout here. No, it just means that if you're asking, well, I'll show you some examples. But, you know, if you've got a, what's, what color, what's your favorite color? <laughs> you know, you think, what would that look like exhaustively? You'd have to have every possible color listed there as an option. Uh, most people would just put, you know, four or five most common colors and then put one called other and then have them uh, fill in the blank. So that, in a way, is kind of being exhaustive as well, because you could still write in, you know, periwinkle or <laughs> whatever weird color is not on the list. Uh, on the other hand, though, this is another kind of a side, another kind of tangent here, but this is kind of what they call othering, right? You, uh, you know, you're saying that your choice is too weird. It's not so far outside the mainstream. We're going to put you into the other category where they might not even have this and they just have a button called other, you know, othering. Kind of the color example is silly, but, you know, if it was something like, uh, you know, what what religion are you? And there was only uh, Christian and, and atheist and uh, agnostic and other, 
know, that might make people feel uh, excluded from that. Uh, anyway, moving on. Uh, unambiguous means that you're not looking at this trying to decide, well, which one is it? <laughs> Is it am I under six? Am I under forty or over forty? Uh, you know, what if you're forty? I don't know. Uh, kind of in the middle. <laughs> That's ambiguous. All right, let's look at some uh, simple survey questions. Uh, so, as usual, we'll look at some horrible, terrible, despicable <laughs> questions <laughs> that are painful, and then we'll look at some of the more effective ways you could phrase this. And this here is probably what you'll be doing, uh, this kind of work. When you start your job, uh, you know, if you tell them you've got good professional communication experience, and they might very well come to you and say, look, we're putting this survey together. Here's, here's my mock-up. Here's my draft. Uh, take a look at this. Uh, let me know what you think. So when that happens, <laughs> uh, first just ask yourself, is it simple? Is it simple for that audience, the people that will be filling out the survey, or is it complicated and it's going to take them forever? Is it going to puzzle them? Uh, because if it, if it is, if it is confusing, that just means the survey will give less useful, uh, if not wrong, uh, results. Uh, so let's look at this first example. Uh, on a scale from one, not satisfied, to four, extremely satisfied, how satisfied were you in the following areas related to your conference experience? Parentheses. If you have no opinion or did not use the following services, simply mark in A. <laughs> Question mark. Okay, so then you get down here. That, well, I mean, just <laughs> right away, I'm thinking these, these words are kind of fuzzy. <laughs> Conference mills. But uh, when you get back to this point, you're ready to fill out the circle. Uh, so you might have to go back and say, let me see, what was it? One was one good or was oh the heck with it? I'll just put one <laughs> for, uh, for each one. Uh, when one was not satisfied, so this could be a skewed result, give you a bad uh, a bad survey just because it's got so complicated up here. Um, not to mention this is a lot to read. Again, people don't want to spend all day filling out a survey. Uh, look at the more effective one over here. Just simply ask, how satisfied were you with the following aspects of your conference experience? So instead of uh, going on up here about one means this and two means that, uh, they just put it next to the bubble that it goes with. So you say, oh, conference mills. So you don't even have to read the question here, right? You could just go straight here, conference mills. Okay, let's see, not satisfied. No, this is okay. <laughs> A lot of bacon. <laughs> I, I don't like bacon. I prefer sausage. Uh, somewhat satisfied. <laughs> At least it wasn't just uh, uh, whole grain stuff. You know, it, you know, you get the idea, right? This is easy. Anybody can do this. Boom, boom, boom. Done. Quick. Uh, so here we're looking at another example, and I'll just say here that the, I think the goal, to borrow from an author named Steve Krug, who wrote a book called Don't Make Me Think about good web design, <laughs> don't make them think, or at least don't make them think about how they're supposed to fill out the survey. Uh, you want them thinking about the subject matter of the survey, right? So you're asking them questions. You want them thinking about the, whether they like the spa. Uh, how much do they like the fitness center? That's where you want their mind. Uh, you don't want their mind up here getting lost in instructions about where to place numerals. <laughs> uh, so don't make them think uh, about the interface of the survey or think too much about what your question means. Uh, instead, you want them focusing in on their uh, you know, thinking back about the experience and uh, and trying to uh, you know give you information you can use and trust. So let's look at this horrible botched example. This is very ineffective. Uh, rank order each of the following guest services and amenities in providing value to you during your conference stay. Parentheses. Rank order each item. Place a one next to your favorite item, a two next to your second favorite item, and so on. Do not place a number next to an amenity or service that you did not use during your stay. Got that? Okay, spa. Oh, there's a blank here. What am I supposed to put in the blank? <laughs> uh, what am I supposed to? Oh, God, what was a one, a two? Did I use the, you get the idea, right? This is just a big mess. Uh, over here, we just simply ask, which of the following guest services and amenities did you use during your conference stay? Check all that apply. Boom, I did the spa. <laughs> yes, I did the, I went swimming. Uh, comedy club, yeah, sure. So you just check all that apply. That's very simple. Now, you might want to have another question on there about each one of these where they're ranking. You know, did you like the spa? Not just did you do it. <laughs> what did you think about it? 
but you, you're breaking the survey up so you have multiple questions. Uh, and especially with a web, a good web survey, if, if you don't check swimming pool in the first question, it's not going to ask you what, how satisfied were, were you with the pool in the next question. You know, if you're competent with that survey tool, you'll you'll be able to set it so it just skips that question. They didn't stay, they didn't go to the pool, so you don't need to ask them about the pool, right? That's an advantage of uh, the uh, digital surveys. Let's see, granting non-leading survey choices. Oh, good. Uh, so here's our leading example. To show my support for the green meeting movement, I would recommend the Prestigio as a good site for a business conference. So this is just exactly like the uh, Prime Minister, yes, Prime Minister sketch was showing you in the, my example about the uh, so-called objective political survey. It's just flat out manipulative. Yeah, what are you going to say? I don't support the Green Meeting Movement. Strongly disagree. Now, of course, you're, you know, you can sort of tell where they, they're leading you. And most of the time people want to, uh, you know, they don't want the person, person that's giving you the survey, especially if it's like a face-to-face -face survey and the person standing right in front of you there with a the clipboard. Uh, you might be a little afraid to give the wrong quote unquote answer because you don't want to make them unhappy or maybe <laughs> they'll get angry at you, start shouting, who knows? Uh, so you're really double sort of biasing your, yourself with that. <clears throat> and if it was, if you were really unscrupulous, you could do this uh, crappy survey and then turn around and say, look at Prestigio. <laughs> look at our, our customers think so much of us. They all put strongly agree. <laughs> oh, by the way, we, we led them with every question. And let's look at a more effective example. I would recommend the Prestigio as a good site for a business conference. So nothing in there about green mo green meeting movement and supporting that. It just simply asks, would you recommend this as a good site for a business conference? Strongly disagree, neutral, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> All right, creating exhaustive and ambiguous survey choices. Now, so again, these are pretty simple. It's a little tricky if you're not trained to look at this thing but uh, we've got some question here about the age so how old is the person so you say, you say are they under 30 they go on that they check a 31 to 40 you check b if they're 41 to 50 they check c but oh <laughs> 50 is repeated there so what if you are 50 which answer is it and then you might have also noticed there's nothing after uh, there's no over 65 here right there's, there should be like over 64 it's the last option. Uh, that's not there. So what if you're say 66 or 67? Uh, you're not even, you don't know what to put. So you're gonna have to ask a question. <laughs> Probably just toss the survey or put the wrong answer. Uh, so you see the problem there, it's pretty simple. All right, survey questions with a single idea. And this is a problem. You know, I was just thinking that if you're teaching English 191 or another course, uh, a lot of times uh, one of the activities you're expected to do is a student survey. So sometimes you get to put together these surveys. Uh, sometimes they're put together for you. But uh, this is one of the things I've noticed is that, this, <laughs> again, the Academy is notorious about this, trying to overload questions. They, they just seem to have a, a terrible time writing a simple question with just one idea. It's always these long questions with multiple prongs to it. And uh, it just it, it doesn't ever really serve the purpose. It, it basically is not a good survey uh, if you're doing this. It's, it's better to have more short questions, simple questions, and then just to have a few really big, long, complicated questions with <laughs> multiple ideas. Uh, so let's look at the example here. It's not too bad. Uh, how much do you know about green meetings and possible savings on these meetings? Uh, so here you can see that there's this idea about the green meetings, how much you know about that, but also how much you know about the possible savings. Uh, so you can say, well, I know a lot about green meetings, but I never really thought about the savings part of it. Uh, or maybe it's the other way around. So you don't really know how to respond to that. It'd be more effective just to break this up. How much do you know about green meeting options for your business? Boom, nothing. Okay, answer that. Then the next one could be about the savings. All right, analyzing the data. <clears throat> So this is a good advice. Learn as much about forecasting and other forms of statistical and quantitative analysis as you can. And also learn as much about spreadsheet, database, and statistical software as you can. 
you know, if all of you were a student at a university where they had classes and all these things, well, that'd be wonderful. <laughs> you could take courses in these uh, areas and learn all about it. And you know, that's exactly what you should do. I know a lot of students, especially in the English uh, English uh, field, they, they, they hesitate. They don't like the idea of a statistics or quantitative anything or math, <laughs> algebra. Oh, my God, you know, algebra. <laughs> Much less... Uh, uh, all this sort of statistical business, and it can get very complicated uh, really quickly. But uh, that said, you still really do need to learn it. It's it's not necessarily uh, you know you shouldn't be intimidated by it, uh, and you can also remind yourself how important it is. That basically, all science uh, more or less comes down to uh, these types of analyses. Is how they collect the data, and if you don't understand surveys or how the statistics are compiled or the way you can be manipulated with statistics and you'll be uh, wide open. You'll be basically very vulnerable to manipulators and you see it all the time. So my advice, same as this, take a statistics, take at least one statistics course, uh, preferably as many as you can. And then anytime you see a course, it's called something like research methods or research designs, quantitative, qualitative, any, any of that, uh, be sure to sign up for it. Because uh, that's really where you're getting. Uh, that's kind of, you know, really and truly, I think you can make a case those those are probably the most important courses you can take, uh, because that's telling you how to do research, <laughs> how to how to evaluate research, uh, how the research is done. In other words, uh, what you'll be doing, uh, hopefully before you graduate, but most certainly afterward. And the same thing with these software packages. You know, these come and go, but uh, you know, you should you should at least know the basics of how to work a spreadsheet, uh, how to enter stuff into a database and how to uh, manipulate the tables and rows and make formula out of the spreadsheet. If you're using something like Excel, you can pretty easily, uh, and once you get your, if you input your data correctly and know what you're doing, you can make it just automatically take that, stick it into a table, a chart, a graph, very easy. And on the same thing with all this stuff. Uh, so basically this is not stuff that you, it's just common sense. Uh, you probably won't just be able to figure this out on your own without any help. Uh, so any courses you can take, uh, videos you can read, uh, videos you can watch, uh, books, it's going to be helpful, but I would say that really the only way to really learn it is to do it. And that's why you need a class with lots of homework. <laughs> uh, okay, other strategies. Well, you could just rely on others uh, in the analysis. Uh, most of the time, you know, you, most situations, uh, people aren't going to be have the exact same skill set. So there might be somebody in the office that's got a lot of uh, statistical knowledge. They can do that part of it for you, or at least help you to do it. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> uh, same thing with the software. Now, I find it's really helpful to know, you know, if you learn a, any software package really well, uh, it's amazing how people will assume, well, since you know that software, you probably know all about <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, these big decisions that we're using the software to arrive at. You know, basically, they think you're way smarter than you are. <laughs> or let me put it this way. Uh, they'll think you're way more knowledgeable than you than you are simply because you know how to work the software so well. Uh, when really, maybe all you did was just sit down for 10 minutes with a YouTube video. <laughs> you know, figure out what the various buttons do and some of the features of the software that aren't immediately apparent. But hey, you've got your reputation now. <laughs> now the people are coming to you, <laughs> which is always good. <clears throat> All right, so staying focused on the business problem. You know, staying on the big picture, you know, just because you've got tables and tables and tables and pages and pages and pages of data and numbers <laughs> and, and statistics, do you really need to put all of those in front of your manager? Uh, do you need to put all that in your presentation and bewilder uh, your audience with all those uh, numbers? You know, they tell, yeah, right here, overloading them with data is a sure way to guarantee they'll forget almost everything you say. So I, I can understand this. You know, you've, you might have been working on this project for a long time. Uh, you, it's very tedious work sometimes doing the data entry, collecting the numbers, putting it into <laughs> the spreadsheet. <laughs> so you think, I want something, I want some bang for my buck here. So I'm going to just have, you know, 10 slides with nothing but showing all my figures and tables and I'm going to print all this out when really it's not going to serve any purpose. Uh, they don't care about all the uh, details. Maybe they just want a little executive summary. Uh, great. You know, sound like you did some good research, but what's the takeaway? <laughs> you know, what'd you find out? Maybe there's just a couple sentences there. Uh, they don't need all this. 
uh, data. But so you know, basically try to resist doing that. Yeah, that's that's basically what I was saying uh, just then. So communicating with numbers is failing to focus on the main message, which tends to be non-numerical. Should we build a let's say there was a you know, should we build another parking? <laughs> should we lower the? Um, let's just say maybe the you know they got this parking garage on campus. Uh, maybe nobody's parking in it, or they're not making very much money with it, so they could say. Uh, we need we need to look into this, figure out uh, you know maybe they're trying to figure out when is the when do most people park, <laughs> and so there might be a temptation to have a, a little entry there for every student, every car, every lot, <laughs> uh, which is really not what they want. They just want the big picture. Like is it? Well, most people are here at noon. Uh, there's hardly anybody here on uh, Fridays. You know that kind of information. You don't need to have uh, this extremely detailed. A chart showing every parking space. All right, so on to the different kinds of uh, charts. Uh, I think there's probably many more than these, but uh, these are the basic ones. Line chart, useful for, for depicting events and trends over time. So think about any timeline you've ever seen, <laughs> or what the EKG or whatever they call that thing, the heart meter deal. So on, like it's just showing you how fast your heart rate is over time, right? Uh, pie charts, useful for il illustrating the pieces within a whole. Right, you've all seen those. I'm sure they'll have some examples uh, coming up. Uh, and then the bar chart, how useful to compare amounts or quantities. So when you're deciding, like, well, yeah, I could put the same data into a line chart, I could put it into a pie chart, or I could use a bar chart. Which one do I use? What's the right answer? And so when it comes down to that, you need to be asking, well, am I interested in the trend over time? Uh, do I, is it more about how it fits in or how big of a slice it is within the whole pie? <laughs> uh, or we, we want a way to visually check out different uh, amounts or quantities. So you can see each one of these types of charts has its, uh, it accentuates certain kinds of info or uh, skews the attention in a certain way. Uh, we'll also look at some other criteria besides just the type of chart. Uh, the title of the chart, how descriptive is it? What are the, first of all, does it have focal points? Uh, hopefully that's yes. Uh, and then the second one is, well, do we, fo do we are they where they should be? Are we focusing on the right things? Uh, the information sufficiency, uh, so did you leave important stuff off the chart uh, that we need to be able to figure out what, what is it saying? Ease of processing, it's kind of self-explanatory, right? <laughs> Basically, is it an easy chart to follow or do you have to sit there and try to figure out what the heck is this? And then the takeaway message. Uh, so what are you trying to get across with this chart? And is that clear and is that successful and effective? So the title should explain the primary point of the chart. It has to be short. Uh, the focal point supporting one main idea. Uh, so again, it's just like the survey questions, you don't want to try to do too much with just one chart. Uh, so it's you might have two or three charts instead of just one chart because of this idea that you only want to have uh, one main idea per chart uh, you don't want to try to have this <laughs> the chart to rule all, <laughs> the mother of all charts <laughs> have every possible thing in there no uh, just one chart per idea uh, the information sufficiency yeah again or sufficiency again just can you understand the ideas there by looking at the chart uh, ease of processing so you've only got the necessary information on there. You've got it labeled. You got it placed in an intelligent way. Uh, you can look at this quickly and see what it's about. And sometimes uh, you get into when you get into this chart software, you notice all oh, it's, oh, 3D. I can put some <laughs> animation in there, and <laughs> I can have all these uh, weird colors and stuff, and I can make it a uh, you know you can do all this crazy stuff with it. But yeah, sure, it looks fancy, looks cool, but it might actually be making the chart hard to follow. Yeah, and then the takeaway message or the essence of the chart, how the information, title, focal points, and other formatting combine to convey that lasting message. All right, and here's some formatting guidelines. And some of these are, are really good. And if you look at the, the type itself, uh, the chart itself, uh, you can see where they've uh, obeyed some of the, or adhered to some of these principles. Uh, one, the data is appropriately labeled. 
Uh, so if we look up here, we've got formatting guidelines and chart type. Uh, those are the labels for this table. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll get into some examples there. And one of my favorite kinds of uh, charts is when they have a picture of something like a, oh, like an amplifier. And they got the knobs there and the buttons pictured. Then they have little arrows, you know, pointing to each one. <laughs> uh, so that's, or they'll have the, uh, the label like right over the button. Uh, so it's, that's really nice because you can clearly see uh, what is what goes with what. Uh, avoid using too many bright colors. Uh, they can be distracting. This, this is probably more for the uh, pie chart than anything else. If you have a bunch of slices and a bunch of colors, it'd be hard. It's actually better to use darker colors to represent the most important data series. Uh, avoiding unusual fonts for those crazy effects. <laughs> avoid 3D charts. Uh, ensuring the text is horizontal. So sometimes uh, the software will want to put a, some text like vertically, but you know what are you you're basically asking the person to have to turn tilt their head or uh, read in a weird way or uh, flip the page around. It's not not effective. Uh, avoiding white type on dark backgrounds. Avoid white type on dark backgrounds in most cases. So that's all charts. Uh, the line chart. So remember what those look like. You might have a couple of different ones, right? Uh, scale should be about two thirds of the range included in the chart. Uh, so think, we'll show you some examples here in a second, you know, what that means. Uh, the name should be placed on or attached directly to the line. So you can put the, the label right there next to the line. That's better than having a key somewhere, a legend off to the side, uh, where you have to keep looking back between this and the lines, <laughs> back here, back here, back here, back here. <laughs> Uh, only four or fewer lines should be included. And I see people make that mistake all the time. They'll have like 12 lines on this thing. Of course, that's useless. You can't read that. Uh, the pie. Now, there's a couple here that I think are great. I hadn't heard this anywhere else. <laughs> this is great information. So remember, the, the pie is the circle one, right? It says the largest slice should begin at 12 o'clock and go clockwise. So that would be... Let's say that was our biggest slice. So it's going to go that way. And then the second largest slice should also begin at 12 o'clock, but that one's going to go counterclockwise. So that's a little bit narrower uh, than that big slice. So that's the way it should go. And then the, uh, I guess the rest of the slices will go around in whatever order. Uh, the pie slices should complete a whole up to 100% of the data series. Otherwise, that's uh, misleading. Now, the exploding slice and basically what that means, sometimes the software will let you take out the slice, kind of uh, this kind of <laughs> business. And that's a pretty horrible representation of it, but you get the idea, right? It kind of separates out a slice. Now, that can be really great as a way to draw emphasis to accentuate uh, a certain slice. Uh, but again, if you, if you use it too much, if you use it more than once, basically it loses all purpose. It just gets confusing. And then finally, the bar charts. Uh, they should be about twice the width of the space in between bars. So think about how much, you know, how much space would you want to put uh, to, between that and the next bar? Well, it's twice the width of the space in between. Uh, baseline should always be zero. Uh, I think they'll show you some examples, but just in case they don't. <laughs> you might have a chart like this, and it looks like, wow, there's a big difference in those chart or those uh, bars. Uh, when really they just cut off, maybe they start here at 50 instead of zero. And where if you had the whole, if they started at zero, it might look more like that. Uh, bars should be arranged in ascending or descending order in most cases. In other words, you don't want to have, uh, you know, alphabetical order really wouldn't make much sense. It'd be harder. It kind of defeats the whole purpose of the bar chart. Because remember what we're doing here is comparing uh, quantities or amounts. It's hard to do if you've got, you know, mix a big mix of uh, sizes a legend should only be used if the chart has two or more data series and i'm pretty sure you know what a legend is but that would just be somewhere off to the side of the chart a little little box little square telling you what the colors represent all right less effective table so we moved on from graphs from charts to tables uh, here we have uh, every, basically everything's on the left margin. There's very little grouping here. Uh, some of these items are categories like gender and income, but they're just kind of mixed in there. 
uh, with these other uh, these other rows. So it's really hard to tell like what's going on. And also, if we get into these numbers here, we got like 154, uh, 15, 31, 36. Uh, so that's telling you how many people uh, were there, right? Days of internet service. Like how many people just took one day? How many people took two days? But it's kind of hard to, to really know what that means. So 31 was on day or two days and 36 were three days. Uh, but what do you do with that information, right? It's, it's kind of hard to process that. Now, when we do the improved chart, You'll notice what they've done is they, they keep on the 31 and the 36 there for the number of people, but they've uh, made it easier to process by putting in uh, percentages. So you see, well, it's 31, so that means that's 13.2% and 15.3%. So it's a little easier to kind of process. Well, 15 is more than 13. You can see about how much. Ooh, there's 6.4%. Uh, so there's a big jump from one day to two day. There's a huge leap from zero to one and, and so on. And so it's a little easier to kind of do the mental picture there. Uh, also, I just notice the title, days of internet service purchased. And then in parentheses, they put number of respondents in parentheses. Okay, and then you get down here and you see the that matches the format of the title. Now, what else? Uh, they've grouped it better. They've used some uh, margins here, some indenting basically. Uh, so gender is now clearly a... Uh, a title, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the word, a label, <laughs> a grouping, and then a male and female come under that heading. Heading, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, and then the same thing with income, they've also got that. Uh, it's a heading now, and then they've spaced it out. So it's a lot easier to read this uh, table. And so some other guidelines for tables, the order. Uh, this, the order your entries, order your entries appropriately alphabetical, numerical, sending, descending, you obviously this would depend on the type of data it is. What, what makes sense? Maybe it makes more sense to have an alphabetical order. Uh, maybe it's not really important what the order is, but you need some kind of order, some kind of reason to pick that. Uh, indentation, indent or otherwise set apart items within the category like we saw with the male, with the gender and the income. Uh, present comparative data series vertically. Uh, label columns and rows effectively. Uh, and while we're on this one, now one of the <laughs> one of the few things. <laughs> now one of the many things I like about uh, D2L, the bright spaces, when you go in the grade book, you know, next time you're in that grade book on D2L, have a look at it at that table, see how they've done this, because they very cleverly made it so that these uh, labels repeat. And so as you're scrolling down this way. You know, maybe you got the students' names here on the left, right? Uh, well, by the time you get way over here, maybe you've just got the grades, but you don't know who the student is. You can't see that part of the line. Uh, so the software will automatically repeat uh, the names of the students there. Uh, so you don't get lost and have to keep going all the way back to the left. Uh, so that's very effective in my opinion. You know, it's one of the things they definitely, they definitely did right. And again, this is something that, you know, I don't know how you could really do this with a paper table, but the computer will let you do anything. <laughs> you can make it repeat however you like, or let the person uh, doing the uh, looking at it make the decision. So very useful. Uh, grid lines. I use grid lines. You know, sometimes you see a table and there's no lines on it. It's just the, the numbers everywhere. And it's kind of hard, again, to kind of match up. Like, where does that go with that heading? Or where does this go? <laughs> there's just 12 out here by itself. What is that? Uh, and then maybe the you have to go all the way back here. Maybe sometimes you even have to take out a ruler and try to, or a straight edge of some sort, try to figure out where it goes. <laughs> That's horrible. Uh, much better to use graph papers and grid lines. Uh, that makes it a lot easier, especially if you do these other two things. Um, well, this one, uh, alternating background colors on rows. So again, look at this table here. You see they got this, what is this, blue, dark gray, or lighter gray. I don't know what color that is, but <laughs> uh, all I can tell you is there's a different color on these rows. So you can see this one looks gray to me. So it's like a light gray and a little bit darker gray or bluish gray. Uh, but that helps me to line these up. It's not really a big, this is not a big table, so it's not, not that big of a deal. But if this was all the same color, uh, I don't think it would be as effective. So you avoid grid lines on all borders. Uh, these tend to clutter the table. Right, so yeah, you don't want to have too many grid lines. 
All right, choosing a research topic. And again, this is a very applicable to grad school culminating projects or anytime you write an essay. And that's what I like about this. Uh, you might think, well, writing, what does a writing an essay have to do with uh, any kind of business situation? <laughs> well, here you go. <laughs> you can see it's very similar. Uh, so just like you were writing that paper for a literature class, a lot of the stuff will be the same when you're doing the, uh, the white paper for this business. Uh, so avoid settling on the topic too quickly. Uh, you want some time to think about it, right? Uh, thinking about how you're going to pace your research, being realistic. You've, you've only got three months or you got a week or a day. Uh, choosing a strategic topic. So even if uh, you like one topic better than another topic, uh, maybe that other topic would be easier, more manageable. <laughs> you could get it done. <laughs> so I see this all the time with the uh, grad students. And they got this topic they really want to write about. But, you know, I'm telling them, look, that's just, I know you're interested in that. I know you're very passionate about it, but are you never going to be able to get that done, you know, in the time frame? Uh, meanwhile, you're already taking a class on this other topic. You know all about it. Uh, you got the knowledge. Uh, it'd be a lot more strategic uh, to do that, you know, or uh, maybe that, it, you know, something along those lines, it's just more strategic to go with that uh, than the other topic. Uh, the scope of the project. Uh, just means uh, how broad is it going to be? You know, is this something that will only uh, <clears throat> maybe you want to keep the scope narrow, limited, just to St. Cloud State students? Uh, maybe you want to expand out to a statewide level, regional level. You know, that's basically scope. Uh, find ways to make your research more analytical, and this would definitely include the type of data you're collecting. What can you do with that data? What will you be able to analyze? And then always talking to others who can help you. Uh, evaluating the data quality. Uh, so this would be the data you collect as well as data you might be getting uh, from a secondary source. So reliability just is exactly what it sounds like. Is it reliable? Uh, how dependable the data is? Is it current? <laughs> if it's something to do with computers or technology, uh, it needs to be probably within the last uh, at least five years. If you're looking at some report data from 1992, <laughs> not very current, not very reliable. And the representative comes down to the sample size again. Uh, so if I'm making conclusions, you know, let's say you want to do some kind of research about English language learners at St. Cloud State University and whether or not a certain kind of uh, exercise or uh, teaching method is working. Uh, if you've only got five students in there and they're all uh, and they're all male and they're all about the same age and they're all from one country. Uh, they're all from the same country. That's not very representative of, of that group you're talking about, you know, the English language learners. So you'd want to be thinking about the population uh, and try to come up with a more, you know, you know a sample that more uh, accurately uh, matches that uh, actual population. Uh, relevance, how well the data applies to the specific business problem. So you want to be asking, why did they collect this data in the first place? What was their objective? And is it compatible with yours? It might still be applicable, even though it was something different. <clears throat> you might still be able to use it. But it, on the other hand, it might be totally irrelevant. Um, adaptability, how well the research can be altered or revised. So I guess that kind of goes along with the relevance. <coughs> uh, expertise, the skill and background of the researchers. And so if it is a question of <coughs> about software, you know, how much of these people know about the software? Are they programmers? Uh, are they, uh, <coughs> do they have a lot of job experience uh, with this problem? You know, this comes up with student surveys all the time uh, is, is expertise. Uh, so the teacher will say, look, I did these. I've been doing these uh, semester surveys with my students and they all tell me I'm a wonderful teacher and I have great teaching ability. Uh, then you think, what is the expertise? You know, these are students in the classroom. These aren't professional teachers. Uh, how much skill and background do they have uh, when it comes to uh, evaluating uh, teachers? You know, maybe, maybe none, right? Uh, and then biases, I guess this, 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 <laughs> this also goes with that. Uh, tendencies to see the issues from particular perspectives. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, this is probably the number one deal breaker in any kind of a research, if, the per if you figure out the person is biased or the group is biased, it's you pretty much have to discount the survey or even dismiss it. 
uh, entirely. Um, you know, if I'm if I'm telling you D2L, you know, I just found this survey or this I just read this study that says D2L is by far and away the number one best software to use. <laughs> it's just amazing. It's wonderful. <laughs> got more features, you know. Well, where did you get that survey or where did that data come from? Oh, I got it from the uh, D2L people. <laughs> it's in their marketing material. <laughs> well, don't you think that might just might possibly be just a little bit biased? <laughs> Maybe they, they're not interested in telling you about the other packages out there and uh, how they, those might be better. Uh, so that's a silly example, but you get the idea. This is why I always tell my students in 191, we do a little project called the Ethical Perspective. And, you know, I tell them, please don't select a topic uh, where your mind's already made up about the topic. You know, you're not, this is about research. It's not about persuading somebody to your point of view. It's about exploring, uh, you know, it's about looking at the research that's out there and uh, you know, really honestly thinking about the issue, weighing the evidence, you know, that sort of thing, uh, not just looking for papers that will confirm your, uh, you know, your, your opinion, your personal opinion. And these uh, these are these are tables here, just telling you about, uh, just giving you some uh, general ideas about the different kinds of uh, sources and how reliable, relevant, adaptable, expert-based, and biased they tend to be. Now, so I, don't, I won't go over all these, but we could take a look at some of them. Yeah, I think this slide's a little more interesting. Uh, so you're probably familiar with the scholarly journals. Uh, so these are, of course, written for the, an academic audience, usually by professors or uh, at least uh, professional researchers. Uh, so you can see they rank the reliability of those high because they've been peer reviewed. Uh, relevance, though, might be low because a lot of times what's interesting to from an academic point of view might not be relevant to a business, you know, making money point of view. Uh, same thing with adaptability. Now the expert experts expertise is high because you know these are professionals, people with PhDs usually. Uh, and then the bias is interesting. I like what they. This is interesting. A uh, thought uh, that the scholarly journals are biased, but their bias is theoretical significance. Uh, so the idea there is if if there's nothing really, you know, maybe they did the research, but if there's nothing really there that's interesting from a theoretical perspective. No new, uh, nothing groundbreaking about it, <laughs> or doesn't uh, fit into the conversation they're having with other academics that might not even be published. So it's kind of a skewed set. And again, they might not, maybe if it's, it would be really significant from a business point of view, but uh, theoretical, no. And they, they got blogs, wikis here, so you can see they're a little more uh, varied all the way from low to high, because you really don't, that blog or wiki, uh, it could be just, written by a kid that's just fooling around all the way up to a professional, you know, the same, uh, it could be the same people doing the scholarly journals. And the same thing with books, business books, you know, they just could be all over the place. It's a little bit of a, you know, unless it's a self-published book, <laughs> you could kind of have a little confidence that there's a publisher there with a reputation on the line. And they can usually, they usually have a, tell you who the author is and you can see this person is indeed an, an expert All right, some of the uh, different kinds of uh, documents or ways to present the uh, the data, uh, report types. Uh, one is the white paper. You might have heard this term. Uh, what is a white paper? Well, it's, it's not really anything too com complicated. It's just a report or a guide that generally describes research about solving a particular issue. So this is the key to this, generally describes research. So they're not, it's not going to be um, super technical. It's not going to have uh, you know, page after page after page of sources. It's just basically kind of a go-between. So they were talking about these green meeting movements. So the, somebody writing a white paper might go into the scholarly uh, literature, the business publications, whatever, uh, get sort of a gist of it. <laughs> you know, what are the salient points here? Uh, write this up into the white paper. And so you don't have to do that work. Uh, the industry publications, uh, these are catering to the specific interest of members in the industries. So if you're a machinist, you have one. If you're a, I get one for whatever reason uh, about government. What's it, what's this thing called? It's government security, computing and securities. It's basically like IT professionals that work for the government. Uh, I don't know why I get this <laughs> publication, but uh, that's what it is. It's just interesting to them. You know, it's very seldom anything in their eye care about. 
Uh, but, you know, it'd be very useful if I was in that field. And I assume most of the stuff in there is trustworthy. You know, it is basically experts writing for other experts. Uh, business periodicals. Periodical is just kind of a fancy way to say magazine. That's if you think about, uh, was it Business Week, something like that, or uh, the Wall Street Journal, uh, business newspaper. You know, so there you can find all kinds of stories, advice. Uh, the Scholarly Journal, hopefully you are already familiar with those, but, you know, they've been through the peer review process. Uh, again, these are scholars writing for other scholars, or researchers writing for other researchers. So they'll be very technical, a lot of jargon, but at least, you know, they've been peer reviewed. <laughs> External blogs, <laughs> less reliable. Uh, carefully determine the expertise of the blog writers. So if you know who the writer is, you know, you could say, well, this a lot of times a blog, if you if you just look at the blog initially, uh, you might not know who wrote it. But if you look usually over here somewhere in the lower right, uh, sometimes at the top right, somewhere over there, there might be a sometimes up here, they'll say about the author. Uh, but if you look over here, you might see a little bit about the the author. And so you could figure out if this is somebody that you want to trust or not. Of course, the whole thing could just be a fake a hoax site. Uh, business and management books vary greatly in terms of overall usefulness. Now, so one of the things I love to do, if, if you're ever at Kinko's, a place like that, uh, they usually have a, I think the post office might have this, I don't know, but they're usually somewhere there's a little rack of uh, business books. It's a lot of self-help books. Usually the topic is, is very similar to what we talk about in this class. You know, basically we'll come back to how to be a better communicator and how to be more professional how to keep up your motivation and that sort of thing. Uh, so that, you know, that uh, might, might be useful, might be totally irrelevant. You just have to look at the book and decide. All right, the library research. So they say, aside from a significant collection of books across a wide range of disciplines and topics, your library contains a wealth of digital resources. And I'd say this digital resources bit is probably more key now than the actual books. Uh, so if you just go to the go to Atwood or go to the local library, you know, you, you can see the books. You, you go to the, oh, I need to look more into these green meetings, right? Do you have any books about green meetings? Oh, no, we don't, we don't have any books. <laughs> oh, well, I guess I should go home. Uh, no, you need to understand this library pays uh, big money, or I guess you do indirectly, uh, for access to these uh, various commercial databases, ProQuest or, or whatever it is. And usually they have a lot more data there, and it's not stuff that you can just get on the internet sometimes. And a lot of times these databases are locked behind a paywall. You have to pay uh, to, to look at these articles, uh, but you don't have to pay if you go to the library. Uh, they might have a you know, login for you so you can just look at the article, print it out, take it home, read it, uh, or read it there. So that's very important to know that. And then yeah, let's see what else. Uh, you likely also have access to thousands of company and industry reports and uh, scholarly journals. So depending on what kind of business it is, what kind of company, they probably have some files, some previous reports. You know, maybe they've uh, done some similar research in the past. Uh, you could take a look at that. You know, at the very least, uh, the HR department, and there's usually something called like an institutional repository. And just look for that word repository. Uh, usually that will take you to uh, where they store the, uh, the information accumulated over the years and hopefully it'll be digitized so you can search it uh, documenting research so you probably won't have to do a works cited page per se uh, but it is nevertheless critical that you say where did you get this information from uh, not just because of the plagiarism you know that would be bad but uh you know usually the usually it's not so much about whether or not you plagiarized it's uh, whether or not they can trust your report so where'd you get the data? Is it a reliable source? Is it biased? <laughs> did you get it from a, some kind of wacky conspiracy website? Uh, did you get it from a, the, the same vendor website who's uh, supplying the software? Uh, where, you know, where'd you get it? You know, that's why you want to document the uh, the info. Yeah, evaluate the data quality. Uh, what was their sample size? Uh, is it representative? And all the same questions you can ask them. Do more than just Google it. 
So if you know how to do more than just Google it, and you're already probably in the top 1%, <laughs> you're really going to dazzle people if you can get the information that they can't get through Googling. Uh, but even with Google, you know, there's so much more you can do uh, than just type in, say, green meetings. You know, if you know how to narrow it down, if you put things in quotation marks, uh, do the minus and, and subtract certain keywords, you know, just that little bit of skill. Uh, being able to go into Google tools and say, just give me the results from the past two years. Just give me the results of this and that. Uh, just a little bit of what, what I call Google foo. <laughs> I can make Google more useful. So I don't want to slam Google too much here. But but yeah, you want to go beyond that. You can go to the business websites, obviously. You can always pick up the phone and call them. You know, people seem to have a phobia about that. But uh, nevertheless, that could be uh, uh, handy. You know, my wife is the type. Uh, she likes to Google everything. If she can't get it through Google or going to the website, she she tends to just give up. And I'll say, well, why don't you just why don't you just call? You know, <laughs> uh, you know, call the you know, the other day we were you know, the UPS people have been trying to deliver some packages here. We weren't either one of us were home, uh, so we're trying to figure out well what can we do? Is there some way we can get to the uh, get this package? Go pick it up somewhere. I went to the website. There's basically nothing there. <laughs> It's been like, I don't know, it felt like hours looking on the web, looking at forums and all this stuff. And finally, I just gave up and called the uh, uh, UPS, what do they call it, UPS uh, management facility, whatever, here in St. Cloud. And within five, I think it took about a minute uh, before I was on the phone with somebody. That said, yeah, you just, you know, come pick it up at 530. <laughs> and so I just say all that to say, you, you know, if the Google's not working, you got a lot of other uh, avenues. Uh, including the phone. Well, let's see, find online discussions and forums. Yeah, so we did that. <laughs> and sometimes this can just make you crazy. Uh, search beyond text-based information. Yeah, so they're talking there about uh, not just the phone, but uh, videos. Uh, so this is another thing I did recently, was uh, I got this, uh, this new microphone stand thing. <laughs> Uh, and it didn't come with uh, very good instructions. So I went to Google and I typed in, what's the name of this thing? Blue, comp I think it's called a blue compound stand. So I typed that into Google. There's really nothing there. I think I found a PDF of the same lousy instructions that came with it. Uh, but then I had the brilliant idea to go to YouTube. And when I went to YouTube and typed in the same thing, then I found some videos that actually showed you <laughs> step by step <laughs> how to put it together uh, so that was awesome you know it's much better actually than just trying to read about it I guess kind of as an English professor I'm kind of always stuck on that you know, always look for text first I want to read about it <laughs> when really maybe it'd be better just to watch a video yeah be persistent all right applying the fair test to your research data and charts uh, so you collect, analyze, present data to others. Ensure that you are providing all of the relevant facts, uh, even if they don't fit into convenient conclusions. So there could be some inconvenient truths. <laughs> so that's the F. So you don't want to leave those out. That's being uh, dishonest, being unethical. Uh, if you know uh, there's another hotel uh, where, where they do this much better, or if you know that maybe the... Uh, uh, I don't know, maybe you know if you missed a bunch of classes, <laughs> maybe that's why your students didn't do so well, right? You, you, were, you were only there for <laughs> half the class. <laughs> uh, so you have to think about this. It could be very uncomfortable, but nevertheless, uh, uh, that's part of being fair. Uh, you know, again, too, they're kind of, I want to get at this idea of uh, convenient conclusions. Uh, so sometimes you just set out to convince yourself of what you want to be convinced of. Uh, so I've been doing some research lately. I, I kind of want to get a new guitar. <laughs> and I want this Gibson uh, Les Paul standard guitar, which is a very expensive guitar. And a lot of people that I talk to about this say, look, Matt, you know, you don't need that guitar. There's guitars that are like a quarter of the price that are just as good. <laughs> so I hear all this and they're pretty credible. I know these people know a lot more about guitars than I'll ever know. And they're telling me that. Uh, but nevertheless, when I get online, it just seems almost magical how I can, how quickly I can find uh, articles and blogs and videos and uh, opinions that confirm what I think <laughs> that the you know Gibson Les Paul standard is way better than these other options. So 
uh, it's just a personal ex example, but you'll you have to be mindful. That's you're probably doing that same thing and not not being aware of it. Uh, so next time you are trying to collect data like that, do some reviews. Make sure uh, that you're not just looking for uh, stuff that fits into the convenient conclusion, but being honest and open, keeping an open mind. Uh, and if you see something that contradicts that, you got to be open to it. You got to consider it. All right, so that's the F, uh, the A in FAIR, grant access uh, to your data. So if I just say, well, yeah, the, I've done all this research and found that the Gibson is the best guitar, <laughs> they say, oh, wait a minute, uh, let's look at your data. Oh, I can't, that's a secret. <laughs> that's confidential. <laughs> I lost it, or <laughs> whatever. Uh, that's not very convincing, uh, not to mention unethical. Or to pretend like I've got secret information that I might not have. You know, this is what journalists get into trouble about. Uh, they'll say, I have anonymous sources, and I've got to protect those sources. Well, you're not granting access. You know, there's a lot of questions about the data at that point, right? Uh, maybe the person just made it up. Uh, let's uh, move on. Let's see. That's the A, the I, impact. Uh, remember the impacts of your data on others and present it with uh, respect. All right, so you might, if I'm collecting, maybe I call up this uh, rival company, I talk to somebody and get a lot of uh, information from them that makes them look bad. Uh, that might have a negative impact, not to mention it's kind of disrespectful to them uh, to, portray my, uh, to portray myself as not doing research or just being a customer uh, when secretly I'm, you know, collecting data on them. And this, by the way, is again why Facebook and uh, all these other social media keep getting into trouble because people say, look, uh, you're not thinking about the impact of all this data on the people that use Facebook. Uh, they might not even be aware uh, of the impact and you're you're not respecting them because you're not telling them up front in clear, unambiguous language, <laughs> you know, what it is you're doing, the type of data you're collecting and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and I like this too. This is a showing you some less fair charts. And I'm gonna recommend a book uh, it's called How to Lie with Statistics. And I can't remember the name of the author right off the top of my head, but it's, it's a little thin paperback book, and it's just page after page giving you examples of just this kind of uh, ch ch chicanery, <laughs> chicanery <laughs> uh, with the charts. Uh, so if you just don't even uh, just you know, step back a second. Let's just look at these uh, bar, uh, bar charts for a second. Now, if you look at this one on the left, it looks like there's big differences between these uh, ratings, right? Like one of the bars is really, really short compared to this bar of the chart, or this uh, uh, bar at the top. And so visually, this looks like it's making a, you know, it looks like a big deal. Look at this, you know? But if you look at these, uh, ax these uh, this axis down at the bottom, you see that it starts, doesn't start at zero or one, it starts at four. Now, so basically what they've done is lopped off the, uh, you know the bulk of the chart to try to make these bars look longer like there's a, they're basically exaggerating uh, the differences between those uh, so hopefully this is clear to you why you would want to start at one and also they didn't label this so you really don't know what the four and the 4.2 are as this one has a note that explains that okay uh, here's our chapter takeaways now uh, we've talked about the relationship between business reports and credibility you know, again, there's lots of ways to be manipulative with surveys and have uh, confusing charts and ambiguities and uh, unfair <laughs> practices. But and ultimately, that, that could very well come back to bite you uh, when it gets out that you aren't to be trusted, uh, that you are uh, fudging your numbers somehow. I mean, it can even be illegal in many cases. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot at stake there. Uh, having a specific achievable research objective, and I think both of those are important. You know, what can you reasonably expect to get done given the time frame, given the resources you had to work with, given the people. Uh, effective design of a survey question. So how can you avoid a leading question and so on. Uh, when you got your data, uh, what kind of chart is, is good? What kind of table would be a good table? How can you make that information clear? Uh, how can you avoid being confusing or unethical? Uh, usefulness of data sources. Um, the difference between primary and secondary research. And then finally, some strategies for evaluating that research. Is, you know, is, it, is it reliable? Is it relevant? 
and you know, how was it collected by experts, <laughs> amateurs, kids? <laughs> All right, so I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, again, if you, I really do recommend that you take any kind of class you can get. Take a research methods class. Uh, take a, statist a statistics class if you haven't already. Uh, if you if you take if you took one a long time ago, you can always get a little refresher course. Uh, there's things online you can do. Um, and I, I just I, f I find it useful personally just to always come back, try to keep my mind uh, refreshed on these topics because again, if it is something that you're not doing all the time or doing regularly, it'll just fade away. It's kind of a lot like math, right? You just kind of have to do it uh, to feel competent. All right, uh, as always, if you've got questions, comments, uh, stories to share, love to uh, read those and uh, have a good time. <laughs> have a good rest of your day and see you next time.